So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Johns Hopkins School of Education, Master of Science in Education, Digital Age Learning and Educational Technology, also known as DALIT Virtual Webinar. My name is Sion John, and I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Also presenting today, we have Dr. James Diamond, Professor and Program Lead. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. First, today's uh, webinar is being recorded. We will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. Also, please take this time to make sure your mic is on mute and your video is off. And lastly, be sure to sign in using your first and last name because we are taking attendance today. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so please type your question in the chat box and Dr. Diamond and I will read and answer your questions. Next, I would like to share the agenda for today's virtual webinar. We will kick off the presentation sharing an overview of the Johns Hopkins School of Education. And then Dr. Diamond will introduce himself and discuss an overview and details of the daylight program. Lastly, I'll wrap it up with admissions requirements and leave the floor open for questions at the end. Again, please keep in mind to type your questions in the chat box at the end of the presentation. To start, so quick facts about the Johns Hopkins School of Education. We are one of nine schools at Johns Hopkins University. We began offering college courses for teachers in 1909 and they became our own school in 2007. For school enrollment, we have approximately 2,608 students, and we offer more than 30 graduate programs, which includes doctoral, master's, and graduate certificate programs. We have approximately 121 full-time faculty members and a strong network of 23,000 SOE alums. We have campuses in Baltimore, Maryland, Columbia, Maryland, and of course, we have offered classes online. We are proud to share that the Johns Hopkins School of Education is consistently ranked one of the top schools in education by the US News and World Report. At this time, I am going to hand the floor over to Dr. Diamond and he is going to introduce himself and present on the Daylight program. Thanks, Sian. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Um, should, I, should I start my video or will, will I just leave that off? Um, and I can actually, I, I, can, I can control the uh, PowerPoint on my end. Uh -huh. Okay, I was asking whether you actually wanted to, me to have the video on to see my face as I was talking. Oh, about. no, no, you're good. The audio yeah. is fine. Yes, I see. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Hi, everyone. Sorry, uh, sorry for the logistical issues. My name is Jim Diamond. As uh, Sian said, I'm an assistant professor here at the Johns Hopkins School of Education, and I'm the faculty lead for the program in digital age learning and educational technology. Uh, I'm very excited to have you all uh, with us this afternoon for a little while. I'm excited to talk a bit uh, about the program. Uh, and I'm always excited to have uh, students who are interested in, in graduate studies in the, the broad field of digital media and learning. Um, so you can see my faculty profile here in front of you. I, I won't read off the screen, uh, which you can read elsewhere. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, about my research, uh, and then we'll we'll uh, start to discuss the program. So uh, I am a fee uh, researcher in the broad field of, of digital media and learning, uh, and I focused for many years uh, specifically in K twelve education, the use of educational technologies in the classroom to support teaching and learning. Most of my research over the years uh, has specifically focused on game-based learning in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and social studies and history education. Uh, so for a number of years, I've worked on projects in which I have either partnered with developers to create games for the classroom and then study how teachers use them uh, and, and, how, uh, and how students learn with them, uh, or I've evaluated uh, games that others have, have produced um, 
for, for the same objectives. Um, I am relatively new here at Johns Hopkins. I've been here uh, just over a year now leading this program. Before that, I worked for many years uh, as a research scientist uh, in, uh, in the nonprofit research and development space. Okay, so that's about me, and you all can feel free to ask me any questions you'd like about my background once, once we get to the Q&A, so why don't we move on and we'll start to talk about the program. Okay, so Dalit is, as you can see here, a completely online master's and professional certificate degree program. So it's a master's of science in education, which entails 36 credits or 12 classes. And then there is also the online graduate certificate for leadership and technology education, which is 15 credits or five classes. Most of our students uh, in the master's degree program finish in around two years. They do it part-time. As you'll see, most of our students are part-time. They typically take two classes a term, uh, spring, summer, and fall, and finish up in about two years. Graduate certificate uh, students typically take about a year or two, a year and a half, but all students in the school have up to, to five years uh, to complete their work. I would say the outlier for us uh, is perhaps around three, maybe not so much an outlier. We have some percentage of students that, that finish up uh, in about three years, depending, depending on their pacing. And as I said already, uh, students can take courses uh, in all three terms. Next, please. Okay. So Dalit is a program uh, that is very well suited uh, for K-16 educators, so meaning teachers in K-12 classrooms and then faculty members in higher education spaces as well. And about uh, between 50 and 60 percent of our students at any given time are in fact K-12 classroom educators with a smaller percentage uh, in the K-12 space. But we also have students uh, who are in school leadership, uh, often as technolo uh, technology leaders or uh, working toward becoming assistant principals. We have students who are educational technologists, not just in schools, but outside in nonprofits, in profit, uh, in, in industry, some students in the military. Uh, we also have students who are instructional designers who are working and studying to become instructional designers. As I noted, we have, uh, we have at any given time several uh, uh, higher ed faculty members, some of whom are in community colleges, some of whom teach uh, in four year schools. Uh, we do have students who uh, are currently leading organizations, um, either their own small startup companies or working for slightly larger uh, organizations in the educational technology space. Uh, and we also do have uh, some students uh, who are consultants in, in the educational technology space as well. Next, please. Okay, so we have about 90 students, uh, plus or minus a few, depending on whether students are active in, in any given semester. As I noted, the large majority of our students are part-time. They're typically taking two courses a term and working full-time. We do periodically have students uh, with the permission of their advisor taking three courses a term, but it's, it's less common because most of our students are uh, working full time. And as you may be aware, graduate work certainly is time consuming uh, above and beyond uh, what you're doing uh, during your nine to five job if you happen to be in a nine to five, nine to five job. Um, it's the student body is split roughly evenly uh, between males and females, and our average age uh, is, is in the mid-30s. And we range uh, probably from the mid-20s to, uh, uh, on the other end, students in uh, their early 50s. Next, please. So geographically, our students uh, come from many different areas, as you can see. Uh, certainly the East Coast of the United States uh, is well represented. Uh, we have students uh, from the South and the Southeast in Texas, um, California, students from Washington State and Oregon as well that aren't represented here. A number of students in Hawaii, 
Internationally, we have students in China, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Pakistan, India, uh, and several, several other locations. So really our students in this program are, are located all over the world. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how students make that work collaboratively uh, a little bit later on. Okay, next please. So it is an online program and all of the School of Education's online programs are based on the Blackboard Learning Management System. All of our courses are asynchronous, which means that uh, they typically are not live courses. Students are not expected to be in the same place at the same time. Instructors will periodically hold synchronous sessions, so they will encourage as many students in their class as possible to show up um, at the same time so that they can either engage in a lecture uh, or some online project activities together. But for the most part, the courses are asynchronous. Uh, you, work, uh, you work in your courses uh, on, on your own time. Um, and the way that our program is structured is that courses are in sessions, typically two week sessions, and students work from session to session, meaning that you can't, uh, when you take a course in the Dalit program, you won't go into Blackboard and see the entire course open to you, right? What you'll probably see are the first th one or two sessions and you'll be working on those and then the sessions open up to students uh, as, the, as the semester progresses. Uh, the online platform involves a combination of many, many media formats, including video lectures, um, some interactive activities, uh, online discussions, synchronous and asynchronous, and students uh, are, are using a number of media uh, for, for their projects, right? So some of the work is written, uh, some of it is video recording, some of it is audio recording. Sometimes they are mocking up uh, tools that they, are, that they are thinking about creating either you know, now uh, uh, as a concept in the program uh, or for, for some point in the future. Uh, I mentioned that periodically, most if not all courses will have uh, a, a synchronous session, typically two, perhaps three, depending on the course. Much of the work in the program is project-based, so meaning that uh, for the most part, uh, our courses are not typical graduate seminars in the sense that you're, you're doing a lot of uh, reading and responding. You will certainly be doing a lot of reading in, in some of our courses, and, and you will be responding sometimes in writing, um, but more often you'll be engaged in creating projects, right? So each session in a course is going to be, is going to be driven by a certain set of learning objectives and a certain set of guiding questions. The reading materials are going to be geared toward helping you achieve those learning objectives and answering those questions. And then a project is going, to, is going to give you a way to put some of those ideas and skills or competencies into practice, right? And you'll have multiple opportunities throughout a course uh, to engage in those types of, of projects. Many of the projects are collaborative, uh, so meaning that students in a course are working together either on one or multiple projects. Um, that's easier when students are, are in the same time zone. Um, it can be a bit more challenging when students are in different time zones, uh, but students use many different uh, technologies uh, like this one, for example, Zoom, uh, to, find, to find a time to gather. Sometimes they use, it, most recently, a tool called Flipgrid, uh, which is a way for them uh, to engage in an ACE synchronous uh, ongoing dialogue with one another. So our students do find ways uh, to collaborate, even though they, they are all over the world. Next, please. Okay, so here you have um, five classes in, uh, in the program. Um, so I'll just read them quickly. Technology and the Science of Learning, which is a, a foundational course. It's the very first course you'll take in the Dalit program, and it's focused on cognitive, uh, cognitive science and a broad area called the learning sciences, right? So the study of how human beings learn. Um, in, 
in any given environment, given, uh, given any set of tools. Uh, emerging issues in digital age learning is what it sounds like, right? So a class that's being refreshed fairly regularly, looking at technologies uh, that are being used in the classroom, in education, in corporate education spaces, in informal learning spaces, uh, and those technologies, as, as you are aware, uh, are changing very regularly, and they introduce new opportunities in learning spaces, and they introduce new challenges in learning spaces, right, for educators, for students, for the organizations in which they sit, and that course is an ongoing discussion about those issues. Uh, designing and delivering online and blended learning environments is, a, is another example of, of one of our core courses. That is essentially a studio course in which you will have an extended opportunity over the semester to conceptualize and begin to build out a larger project. Um, similar to the types of projects you'll be working on in other courses, but there tend to be more of those. In this course, you're, you're working towards something a bit larger uh, by the end of the course. Data-driven decision-making, uh, a course that focuses on introducing students to competencies um, in, in analyzing data and using it uh, to make decisions either, either at the classroom level or in an organizational leadership uh, capacity. And as a last example of a course here, Tech Leadership for School Improvement uh, really is a course focused more on um, thinking about how leaders in educational organizations uh, can, um, can create and implement and manage visions uh, for the use of technologies uh, in their different professional contexts. So that's a, that's a sampling uh, of our courses. Uh, a few of these uh, you'll take if you are in the graduate certificate program, you would wind up taking all of these uh, if you uh, are in the, in the master's degree program. I should mention that all of those are, are three credit courses, as, as are all the courses in our program. Yep, next please. Okay, so the Dalit program uh, consists of about 12 instructors. We have two, uh, two full-time uh, faculty members, myself and Dr. Chris Devers, uh, who's also a researcher in the area of the learning sciences. Uh, Dr. Devers is based in, in Indiana. Uh, and then we also have uh, 10 adjunct instructors who uh, work in a range of uh, in professional environments. Uh, several of them are in leader, leadership positions in K-12 schools. They're either principals or assistant principals. Uh, we have several instructional designers uh, who teach in the program. We have several um, instructors who uh, are employees of the federal government. Uh, we have several instructors um, who are affiliated with, with other programs in educational technology uh, at other universities. Next, please. Okay, so in terms of careers, uh, and there's a couple of ways to look at this, right? Careers uh, that people, uh, in which people currently exist when they come into the Dalla program, and then careers uh, if they're thinking about changing careers uh, that they move into after, after leaving a, a program like Dalit. So I noted that uh, at least half of our students uh, are in the K-12 space at any time. I've talked a bit about higher education. We do have students in technology consulting. Uh, we have students who are instructional designers in the nonprofit space, in industry, um, in, uh, in, in the publishing world. Uh, we have several students at any given time who are who are in the U.S. military, typically stationed um, at different places in the world, uh, who are often interested uh, in becoming instructional designers um, for for the military. Students in publishing, uh, students uh, who work in media production, either as producers or developers, and similarly uh, in in the video game or. Uh, educational game development space, working as developers or, or producers. So about, I would say, roughly half of the students who come to us as teachers, right? So that's about half of the, of the students in our program. And then about half of them 
are typically considering leaving their classroom and, and thinking about a graduate degree in educational technology as a way to do that. Now, they're not always thinking about leaving schools, right? So they may, they may want to move out of the classroom into a leadership position, either at the school district or the state level. And then some of those teachers are thinking about leaving um, the education space altogether, uh, sometimes going into, into publishing, sometimes going into uh, consulting and sort of the, the, you know, the broad educational technology or educational technologist uh, space. Others who come to us, there are some career changers. Uh, so we've had uh, several engineers in the last year uh, who come either out of uh, civic engineering, aerospace en engineering, who are thinking about moving into formal education from where they are, either at the K-12 or higher education level, and are interested in pursuing a degree um, that prepares them to that prepares them with a foundation of the learning sciences, right? So, so there's a rich literature at this point around how people learn with technologies. So people who are thinking about career change will often uh, come into the program wanting to develop a broader foundation in the learning sciences in cognitive psychology, but then also uh, take on specific or learn specific applied skills, right, in the area of actually developing and implementing technologies. Um, and the career changers, uh, as I gave you one example, uh, come out of engineering. We've had uh, students uh, who are lawyers uh, who are thinking of, uh, of making a career change, uh, and some people who are coming out of uh, corporate spaces as well and, and thinking about either uh, sort of going into a different sector uh, of industry or, or moving into the K-12 space. Okay, next please. I've mentioned the program is fully online. It is certainly applicable to many organizational contexts. What do I mean by that? Uh, educational technology, as you are aware, uh, is, is a very, very broad field and highly applicable in many spaces uh, and is growing. Right, so uh, as, as a society, as we continue to develop and use technologies to assist in learning uh, in different types of environments, there is a need for educational technologists, right? So not just developers or not just psychologists, uh, but people who have some blend uh, of those types of skills and are able specifically to apply those skills in, in educational settings. Uh, you also have a faculty uh, with a solid foundation of research in the educational technology space. Uh, so Dr. Devers and I have both been successful um, in bringing in grants and doing uh, research in our respective areas to try to contribute new knowledge about how people do learn with technologies. And then as I noted, our instructors uh, have uh, collectively a large amount of professional experience uh, in their context and really do occupy uh, a number of different a number of different areas professionally and are fantastic resources for our students uh, who are thinking about making changes in their careers or who are thinking about expanding or extending their professional networks uh, it's a real strength of our faculty Okay, so here we have an example uh, of what, um, let's call it the typical student, right? So you have, you have three terms here, right? For the, master's, for the master's degree, you can see this student is taking two courses per term. Uh, so at six terms, um, you're, you're done by, you know, beginning fall 19, you would be done by summer 2021. Uh, a couple of things to point out here, you can see in the first term, Technology and the Science of Learning, that is the first required course for all students to take. In the last term, summer 2021, is the advanced seminar uh, and advanced application. Those are the capstone experiences for the master's degree. So any student who graduates from the program must have this capstone experience. And that involves a combination of an independent study 
in which a student is doing even more work in conceptualizing and potentially implementing uh, a prototype educational technology, or at least a solution uh, for some sort of problem, either in their own professional context or in some other context uh, in consultation with the, with the course instructor. And the advanced seminar, uh, which is taught in partnership, as it were, with the advanced applications course, is where students create their own professional portfolios, right? So again, thinking about the emphasis on project-based learning in this program, as students are developing projects, in time, those are going to be going into their professional portfolios as examples of their competencies, right? So the Dalit program is aligned to uh, two professional organizations. So the first is ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education, and the second is AECT, the Association for Educational Computing and Technology. Those are two professional organizations uh, that, that really consist of a wide range of professionals. Uh, but ISTE is chiefly focused on educators uh, using technology irrespective of their professional context. And AECT is largely an organization of instructional designers and instructional technologists. Both of those, both of those organizations have standards, have, have professional learning standards. Our program, our learning objectives are aligned to those standards, right? And one of the reasons being that our expectation is that those standards represent uh, the broad needs and goals of any number of professions, right? Those are competencies that um, professions in the, in the broad area of instructional design and technology are saying that they need employees to have. So our program learning objectives are then aligned to those and the course objectives are in turn aligned to the program learning objectives meaning that your projects are ultimately in part meant to demonstrate competency for that larger set of standards so that when you graduate the program uh, and you might be thinking about looking for a new job or a new career you have a professional portfolio in hand that represents the range of your competencies, right? You've curated this work uh, of projects that you've, that you've created over several years, and you have a digital portfolio that you can either share with prospective employers or even with your current employer, right? Um, as an opportunity to discuss your growing skill set, uh, as an opportunity to discuss uh, your ongoing professional goals and, and how your current organization might uh, help you continue to build on, on what you've done in this program. Okay, next please. Sian, I think this is you, right? Yes, it is. Well, thank you, Dr. Diamond. Uh, so now we're going to continue by going over the application requirements. Uh, applicants must submit a completed application, which can be found on our website. Keep in mind, there's an application fee of uh, $80. You will need to submit a current resume or CV two letters of recommendations. Uh, if you are unable to have one academic letter of recommendation, we will accept two professional letters of recommendation. Um, next, a 500 word essay must be uploaded to your application. So please visit our website on the admissions webpage to learn more about the essay portion of the application. And lastly, we need all official transcripts, including institutions you may have taken courses but did not receive a degree. Again, this is from all post-secondary institutions that you have attended.
If you are an international student, you must submit a TOEFL or IELTS score. If your degree was completed outside of the US, you will need to complete a course by course evaluation. Additional information can be found on our website. Also note that we do not offer I-20 for part-time or online programs. Please contact the Office of International Services if you have any questions about that. For tuition, the current tuition for the 2019-2020 academic school year is $840 per credit for online courses and a and a $15 technology fee, and that's again per credit. Um, as soon as we know about the 2020-2021 uh, tuition, we will have it uh, shared on our website. Please keep in mind this excludes textbook, course materials, graduation fee, and registration fee. Registration fee. Additional fees apply and are charged separately from tuition. We encourage you to view our tuition and fees page on our website for the most up-to-date information about tuition and fees so that you can understand the complete picture of the cost associated with becoming a student here at Johns Hopkins School of Education. If you're interested in applying for financial aid, we strongly encourage you to apply for financial aid when you start your application. Please note the priority financial aid application deadlines listed on this slide. Please visit our website if you have any questions relating to financial aid. You'll find contact information for the Office of Financial Aid and details of loan and scholarships that are available. If you have any questions relating to your application, please feel free to email or call us. Also, this is the address you would use to send any supporting materials such as official transcripts if you plan on mailing your official transcripts. And here are additional more uh, point of contacts. Tyreen Maddox for the uh, for admissions coordinator. So if you have any admissions related questions, please reach out to Tyreen. If you have any program related questions, we have the uh, Liesl McNeil and then of course Dr. Jim Diamond. Thank you for attending the daily virtual webinar. At this time, Dr. Diamond and I would like to open up the floor for questions. Uh, the first question we have is, is this still being recorded? Yes, this virtual webinar is recorded and it will be sent uh, within one week after the event date. The next question we have from Esther. Um, is it possible to finish the master's in one year if going full time? Dr. Diamond, would you like to answer that question? Sure, thank, thank you, Esther. Um, in theory, uh, it, it might be possible uh, to, to complete uh, your master's degree in one year. It's not happened uh, since I've been here. Uh, it would involve, I think, a considerable amount of discussion. And actually, I, I will ask you, Sian, I, I don't know if, whether we actually have a formal policy around uh, completing completing in a year. I would say that I would strongly recommend against uh, completing um, your your degree in a year. And and I don't say that lightly. I understand that um, people have timelines, professional and personal timelines, and uh, it is certainly important um, to be able to complete degrees in in a timely manner. But the expectations of graduate students, there, there are such significant expectations in terms of the amount of work um, that has to be done that to take a full course load and, and be able to, to finish in a year, it's very, very difficult for me to imagine uh, doing that well. It's difficult for me to imagine 
uh, being able to actually benefit uh, from, from all of the courses and be able to commit the amount of time uh, that it would take for reading, for collaboration, for working on projects, um, and doing that across uh, four, four courses per term, uh, for example, I, I, think would, I think would be extremely difficult and, um, and quite possibly a, a disservice uh, to yourself. So that, that's my answer to that question. But, but Sian, do we actually have a formal policy about completing a degree in a year? Do you know? Um, so one thing that we have in regards to a master's program here at School of Education, um, the student has up to five years to complete the program. Mm -hmm. if the classes are offered um, in order to for the student to be able to complete it in one year, then there's no like official policy on that. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. That is also important. Thank you, actually. That, that is also important uh, to note that um, it would be very difficult given that um, every course is offered at least once per year, but scheduling it in such a way uh, that you would be able to take all of the required courses and, and do it a, uh, in a year, I, I think would be very, very challenging. Our next, I hope that answered your question. Our next question we have is, is there a designated space within Blackboard to connect with other students to discuss assignments or ask questions? Oh, what an excellent question. Yes, uh, in, in every course, um, one of the foundations of a course, there is a discussion space. And you will be expected in every course to engage in ongoing discussion, either with, uh, or I should say in, in both cases, with, with members of a particular team with whom you might be working on, uh, uh, working with on a project, uh, or other classmates. So you will be expected uh, to engage in, in dialogue regularly uh, with your classmates. And, and every course in Blackboard uh, does have does have space for that, yes. Wonderful. Our next question we have from Esther. What percent of your current students in the program are part-time and full-time? About 90% of our students uh, are, uh, it's actually, it's, it's closer to 100%, to be honest with you, uh, are, are part-time part-time students. We may have one or two certificate students uh, who are, who are full-time, um, but off the top of my head, um, they're not coming to me. So, so the great majority of our students are part-time. Our next question we have is, Dr. Diamond, I was wondering what your opinion is on where e-learning is heading as a field to elevating equity and ex uh, accessibility. Oh my gosh, what a fantastic <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, and uh, yeah, I love this question uh, and, and we could spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, so what is my opinion? How, how about I give you my hope and I give you my opinion? Um, and actually, let me, let me give you a little bit of preface as well. In our program, there is a focus on universal design for learning, so UDL. Uh, for those of you who are or are not familiar with UDL, UDL uh, is essentially a framework um, that is intended for all learners, not necessarily just learners, uh, and I say just in quotes, uh, who, who might have uh, disabilities, who are differently abled. Um, often we talk about things like assistive technologies um, for, for certain students, things like screen readers come to mind, for example. But universal design for learning is much more expansive. The idea being that people have different learning preferences. They don't necessarily have different learning styles, right? Which is a common term in the education space. Um, that the research really suggests at this point that there's no evidence uh, to suggest that people have different learning styles, but they do have different learning preferences. People like to learn in different formats, right? Uh, could be uh, through reading, could be through physical interaction, 
could be listening to um, the spoken word. It could be watching videos. It could be playing games, right? Any number of different formats. And the idea behind universal design for learning is, is that educators, we need to be keeping those preferences in mind um, as we design and implement materials. So the concept of a UDL framework is revisited throughout many of our courses. Now we do actually have a specific course called In Inclusive Technologies for All Learners that is a combination of a focus on UDL, uh, but then also brings in a focus on, on some specific assistive technologies. My opinion uh, is that the field will continue to bring in UDL as a way uh, to, to expand opportunities for all learners, right? Uh, so a, a focus on equity is essentially, is, is one of the foundations of, of UDL. My concern, I will say, um, about the, the quote unquote promise of e-learning is that I think that there is a tension between the objectives of school systems and the objectives of product developers. Um, and sometimes they are in sync and sometimes they are not. And I think there are many product developers that develop technologies um, that may have the best of intentions. They may not have been developed in any way uh, with a thought to, to the needs of specific learners. Uh, in some cases, uh, they may have been. Um, and then you have schools and other educational uh, institutions, higher ed, corporate training, um, that are in need of those technologies, but may not have the capacity or the skill set to evaluate those technologies with respect to a focus on equity, right? With respect to a focus on bringing opportunities to all learners. Um, and I think that it's one of the responsibilities of programs like mine and others uh, to continue to push on a framework like universal design for learning, to continue to push for a focus on equity and the achievement of social justice um, in the use of educational technologies. Um, so that's a, a very long response. I'm not sure if I've answered your question. And, and I think it's a, it's a great one. <laughs> uh, and I'd love to, uh, to continue that, that conversation at some point. Um, but I hope that answers your question. So the next question we have from Alice Allison is, how many applicants do you have each year on average to this program? And how many do you admit? Mm, that's a number I should have, uh, have off the top of my head, and I do not. Um, you don't happen to have those numbers handy, do you, Sion? I don't have the exact number with me. Uh, if I had to ballpark it every year, we must have, oh gosh, um, about maybe between 40 and 50 applications. I think that's about, I think that's about right. Uh, and we probably admit oh, between 40 and 50% of those. I think that's about right. Right. And then it looks like they, uh, there's a second part to this question. Uh, do you admit international students and what are the requirements for GRE, TOEFL, and GPA? Uh, so this uh, program, yes, uh, we do accept international students. Uh, this program, as you, I'm sure you saw on the uh, slide, uh, Dr. Diamond mentioned about how diverse in terms of, you know, everyone's background, experience, and also kind of with their current location. And then what are the requirements for GRE, TOEFL, and G, uh, GPA? So there is no GRE requirement for this program. TOEFL, uh, it is 100 for internet-based and 600 for paper-based. And then GPA requirement is a minimum of a three, we do prefer a minimum of a 3.0 GPA on a scale of 4.0.
The next question we have, uh, Dr. Diamond, this is for you. Is there a master's thesis that's required at the end of this program? There is not a master's thesis that is required. There is a master's thesis that is an option. So what is required for, the, uh, for students at, at the end of the master's degree program is the capstone project that I discussed, right? So that's essentially six credits of the advanced seminar and the advanced applications uh, course uh, in which students are developing their portfolio and then also focusing on a capstone project, right? Conceptualizing it, designing it, uh, and then depending on their time frame implementing it right in a specific professional context and doing that in consultation with the course advisor and then actually a professional liaison in uh, in whatever organization uh, they happen to be developing for so that's uh, that's the capstone outcome uh, for this program students do have a thesis option right and typically what that means uh, is is writing and a piece of research right uh, so it's certainly not as large as something like a doctoral dissertation, um, but it is an opportunity for some students, particularly those who might be considering doing doctoral work after finishing this program, to have an early experience with uh, conceptualizing a piece of research, with laying out um, a framework for conducting that research and then analyzing data, and, and writing something about it and potentially publishing off of it. Uh, very few of our students take the, take the thesis route, but, but it is an option. Thank you. Another question from one of our prospective students. I'm wondering to what extent will one learn to design or code and engage with the UX or UI of learning interfaces? It's a great question. Um, so the program itself, as it is currently constructed, does not have specific courses related to development, right? So there are not specific courses in which you're learning to code in Python, for example, uh, or doing deep dives um, into particular apps or technologies that you might use uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the UX area. Um, you will do so incidentally for several of your courses, right? Because you will need to dive into some of those as you're working on your projects. But it's not actually a formal requirement of the program right now. Uh, the reason that I say that is, is because that actually is in flux. Um, we are in the process of um, developing uh, several new courses for the program that have a focus on uh, on the broad area of computational thinking, uh, and then also computer science for educators. Um, our thinking right now, uh, because we are not a formal teacher preparation program, so these are not courses that will prepare teachers, for example, to become computer science educators, uh, but they would prepare, and these, these really, the, these two courses I'm talking about, uh, really are focused more on our students in the K-12 space uh, who might, um, have a goal of integrating computational thinking and some level of coding uh, into, their, into their coursework. It's right now for students outside of the K-12 space, you would have fewer options, um, you know, with the exception of what I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, you'll develop some skills, but it will be incidental to the main, to the main goals um, of the course. So, in, you know, it's not in that sense a sort of strictly an instructional design and technology program in which you'll walk out uh, with a specific set of technology skills. It's a good question. Another great question from Esther. I'm very interested in learning and development in children. Would you say you have faculty or courses that focus on ed tech for children? We do. Uh, so technology and the science of learning is, is designed broadly uh, to, to introduce you to concepts in development uh, of, of human development and child development uh, and, and, the use of, and the use of technology. Several other courses um, 
including the UDL course that I mentioned, uh, another course that I, was not listed on one of those slides called Integrating Media, uh, Integrating Media and Technology into Standards-Based Curricula, uh, is another course that focuses specifically on having students think about um, the use of, of technologies, of specific technologies uh, for children. And then several of our students in their capstone ex experience uh, have also conceptualized uh, technology for, for early childhood and, and childhood education spaces as well. Okay, great. Next question we have is how many credits do I need to take in order to be considered a part-time and full-time student? So I will share that part-time you would have to have 4.5 credits and full-time would be nine credits. And we do have one more question. Can I enroll in this program if I currently have a um, if I currently have a bachelor's in a completely different field? Um, it looks like this pr uh, person does not have a background in education. Oh sure, yeah. So that that's also a, a great a great question. We have, you know, educational technology is a very broad space. Uh, so you know, we have students. Uh, who did their undergraduate degree specifically uh, in teacher education. We have students who, as I mentioned, come out of engineering, uh, students with uh, undergraduate degrees in English, in social studies, um, in sociology, uh, in psychology. Um, so, so, yeah, we have students who come uh, really with a pretty significant uh, from a significant range of fields, which is which is terrific uh, for for the field of educational technology because it is so interdisciplinary uh, in its scope. So yes, we certainly welcome applications from many different areas. All right, wonderful. Are there any other questions? I'll give us about like one minute. We have one question. So it says, uh, is there an opportunity to speak to you about uh, specific questions? Sure, please do. Just send me an email. <clears throat> I think my email address is, uh, is on one of the slides. And, and certainly just send me an email and we can uh, either arrange for a phone call uh, or we can communicate uh, via Zoom or, uh, or via email, however you like. So, so feel free to get in touch. All right, it looks like there are no more questions. Thank you again for your interest in the Johns Hopkins School of Education. We look forward to hearing from you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.